All right. Hey, everyone. This is James Wilson with MTV Strength Training Systems, and uh, welcome to another Bike James podcast. Today, I've got a special guest. I've got Matt Miller. And Matt, like me, has his uh, hands in a couple different projects. So his uh, main project is, uh, or one of the things we're going to talk about today is a break ace device. Uh, his website is mtvphd.com, where he's got a lot of great info. And he's also got a podcast called the Performance Advantage Podcast. Uh, so yeah, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Welcome, uh, or excited to talk to you more about some of your projects and stuff. Yeah, hey, James, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be on here with you. Awesome, man. So yeah, we chatted a little bit before uh, we hit record. And so uh, you're actually in tomorrow. You're in New Zealand. You're an American living in New Zealand. And so, uh, and of course, with the time difference, we, uh, I, I said, hey, let's talk on June 1st. And, and I was talking my time, forgetting that you guys are so far ahead. So, um, so anyways, we, we made it work. We're here talking today. So um, I guess before we get going, tell me a little bit about your background, like kind of how you got into the position you're at. I mean, you, you do, like I said, you've got your hands in a bunch of different uh, uh, things. And so kind of how did you find yourself in the you know, position you are today? Yeah, well, I guess I grew up around bikes. So I grew up in the family bike shop in a little town called Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And honestly, like most of the time as I was growing up as a kid, I was not interested at all in riding. Uh, but as I got into high school, I met some friends that were into riding and I really got into it. So I did the whole racing thing and I was like one of those, you know, classic bad pros that's kind of like like pretty good but kind of also sucks and has no idea what they're doing and it took me a long time to realize I was basically doing everything wrong so I decided to continue to study like the physiology side like okay what's happening in my body uh how can I get better how can I help myself get better eventually help other mountain bikers get better and so I did uh, a bachelor's and master's in exercise science and I really enjoyed the studying part of it so I just hit up this professor in New Zealand I cited his paper for some of my research I was like hey I'd love to do some mountain bike research with you so next thing you know I'm on the plane I'm moving to New Zealand and I've been here ever since Awesome, man. So, uh, so you have a, a PhD. I mean, so when you say the MTB PhD, like that isn't just, uh, you know, uh, you know, marketing hype, so to speak, like you <laughs> literally are, you have a PhD, uh, you know, with in, in mountain bike kind of a specific, uh, study. So that's, uh, that's really cool. I mean, most people don't even realize that that's a, a possibility. So, um, so that's, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's like I said, I when I was reading your background on the website, I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. Um, and so I actually spent a uh, just side, uh, side note, I spent a year, my one year of college uh, at uh, um, uh, Lehigh University. So, I was oh, cool. so yeah, I'm in you know, Nazareth area like that. Uh, yeah, so was, yeah, yeah, there's great trails there. Yeah, you know, I wasn't into mountain biking then. Like, I I didn't get into mountain biking until I was uh, kind of how old was I? Like, almost like twenty three. So okay. when I when I got my first mountain bike, and it was kind of through the back door a little bit. Like, I got it. I, I was wanting to ride my bike to work. I was living in Santa Barbara, working for a company that certified personal trainers, and I was like, man, okay, I need to. I want to ride my bike because parking was atrocious. It still is. And I thought mountain bikes looked. Uh, I thought road bikes looked weenie. And I thought road mountain bikes looked tougher and looked more like a BMX bike that I, you know, I could relate to. So I got a mountain bike and and then that was, that was kind of how I got into it. It wasn't even to start mountain biking. It was more to just like commute to work. But then I rode up and down a fire road one day and I was hooked. I was like, Oh, this is really fun. <laughs> and so, yeah, like you though, man, like it's funny hearing Cause I was, it's like, all right, how do I get better? Right? Like the, the, the realization that the human body is supremely adaptive and so if you give it the right inputs it'll give you the you know improved outputs and sometimes if you're not seeing the outputs that you want it's because you're not giving it the right inputs and i think you kind of were alluding to that where you were languishing in what used to be known as semi-pro uh level and then uh you know figured out like hey i'm doing some of these things wrong um, so I guess like before we, you know, just begin on my own curiosity, what, what were some of the, 
the the things that you would say like hey i was doing this and this wasn't the best and through my study you know i found out that, that this was actually a better way and i've seen better results with that i mean they're kind of a a couple big uh you know takeaways from that experience that that you you find yeah totally um so i guess like for someone when you don't ride a lot like you're gonna you want to go hard right so mm -hmm. when i started riding yep go hard and then i have a few days off because i'm not super committed but i continue to get better right so i'm going hard and then recovering going hard and then recovering and then when you get really focused on trying to improve you end up spending more time on your bike and if you take that same approach of like going hard every day which is kind of what i did um you just dig yourself a really deep hole and that's basically what happened to me so i find myself like digging like going hard or too long or just slightly too hard every day you know six hour rides things like that and then i'd just be so buried that i wouldn't want to look at my bike i'd be too tired i'd get to a race i couldn't perform I'm like looking at it like i'm riding 15 or 20 hours a week why am i so like why am i going backwards so once i you know i guess these days it doesn't take um much to kind of figure out like that's the wrong way to do it but for me I was maybe a little bit slow and uh it took me a kind of a while to understand and realize all these things that like okay if I'm gonna do a six hour ride maybe I should just like take it easy um once I started to do that things started to get better um and then by then yeah I was getting more interested in working with with other riders and kind of helping them to not make the same mistakes that I made but that's like the one the biggest and most common mistake I see is that um riders just go way too hard way too often and there's a lot of benefits in just going out and taking it easy once in a while and developing aerobically yeah no that's uh um you know one our sport mountain biking it's such a young sport I mean think about it like even 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 those people say like oh mountain biking has been around for blah 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 like I would argue that like modern mountain biking as we know it, you could draw a line around the year 2000, you know, give or take a couple years, you know, maybe, but you know, that's when you had, you had your, you know, the, the, the Marzocchi bomber fork, the haze disc brakes, like, you know, some of these things that man, people just take for granted uh, today, like, Oh, reliable suspension that won't break and reliable brakes and, you know, disc brakes and, and, you know, these things, that again we kind of take for granted today like these by that point by by 2000 around that time we kind of had the basics figured out you know and and i mean i i have i still have a turner rfx i got a frame that you know i swear i could build that thing up and i know it's not going to be as like you know as good as a, a modern show bike but it's not you're not going to look at it and be like the the bike that like john tomac used to race cross country on with the drop bars you know that like looks completely different than what we would think of as a mountain bike and so you know the the sport as we know it is really only been around for like two decades i mean you could argue that it, it's been around for maybe two decades as we know it and you know there are some lessons that you can draw on but man it, it's it's guys like you who are helping people avoid that you know you, you you say that like oh today it's not so hard to figure that out but that's because guys like you made the mistakes, you know, figured out, wait a minute, how do I adapt this better to, to mountain biking? Um, and then help get that information out there. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're helping do our sport a service because man, it wasn't, you can go back five, 10 years ago and, and the training knowledge was nowhere near what it is today. So it's, uh, so yeah, man, no, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, that's cool. Like I said, your, your story sounds really similar to mine as far as like, just, Hey, how do I get better? And then, you know, how can I help other riders avoid some of these same mistakes? And so, you know, that kind of passion driving what you're doing is, uh, is really cool. So, um, so one of the, one of the areas that this pushed you into was the break ace. And so I guess for people that aren't familiar with it, one, you can find out more at breakace.com. Uh, explain what it is real quick. And then, you know, we'll, we'll start diving into, you know, like what exactly it does for riders and their performance, but what is break ace? Yeah. Okay. So I guess like backstory on break ace is when I came to New Zealand, we were going to focus on physiology. So I was going to take four years and study physiology mountain bike because not much had been done. 
So mm. I started that and we were looking at these vibrations and like, wow, this is so unhealthy. Like these vibrations going to your head or it's like beyond what you'd get like using a jackhammer at work. So, um, and your body's doing all this extra work to stop the vibrations from getting to your head. So we did a bit of that, but then we kind of like, I was, I was collecting some data for uh, one of those studies and I was racing against my supervisor who was like an incredible road cyclist. He raced on the Australian team in like the nineties, like the heyday when everyone was like doping and he was a clean guy trying to get through the field, still super fit. He's like 50 crazy fit. And we we're racing in this XC race at this beachy trail, Sandy, uh, just like the, if you can imagine like the most like heroist dirt possible and uh like these tight turns no berms just amazing dirt and we were doing this xc race and i was able to keep up with him in this xc race and i know what his threshold is and and vo2 max is because i measured it i know what mine is and there's really on paper no way i should be able to keep up with this guy so the only way i was able to keep up with him is because he was breaking in every turn Whereas I was like, just laying the bike over, getting as much grip as possible, just absolutely loving it. So right then and there, middle of this race, I'm like, why would I continue studying this physiology thing and like how, whatever his power output is when actually this braking is such a huge problem. Mm. So for him, it's slowing him down. For me, I'm able to do it differently and go faster. We need to look into this. So on Monday, I went into the office and I was like, said to my supervisor, sat him down. I was like, Hey, I want to measure braking. What do you think? And Steve, professor, Steve Stannard, my lead supervisor, he's like, I don't care. Whatever you think you want to do. I believe you let's do it. So it had never been done before. No one had really measured braking and we had to do it right. We had to do it scientifically. So we went to the drawing board. We developed this brake power meter. And finally, now we could like, we got made it for like three grand. New Zealand, which is like nothing, it included the data logger, and we hired um, an engineer to make this massive mount in his shed. Like, there's photos online. I ended up taking that one around to injure bike. It weighed like five kgs just on the bike. Had this super heavy duty load cell because we had no idea how like intense the braking would be. Uh, but we we did it, and um, yeah, and then we just spent years measuring braking. Nice, and so your the break ace then is your i guess kind of more uh uh obviously weighs less than than five kilos um yeah. you know so the, there's been an evolution of the product and so somewhere along the line you decided that like hey this is something that like the average rider would be able to benefit from and so your you know the the break ace is is your i guess kind of the attempt to bring this technology to you know riders who, who don't necessarily have access to like you know your university uh stuff yeah right? totally totally like um the whole time i've been the whole reason i started this was like okay yeah pros get it they're like oh you can help me measure my braking and i can figure out where to go faster i'm in but what i wanted to do is i wanted to help the everyday rider who doesn't want like a data logging system on their bike and like heaps of wires they don't have access to a team so, you know, but we spent years trying to like going through the data, like, okay, this is the part that's most important for everyone to know. We need to show this. This is how we can use it to get faster. And the whole goal was so that your everyday rider could use this information to have more fun and get faster. Yeah. So I guess uh, uh, a softball question for you, but something that, you know, probably a lot of people wouldn't have think, thought about like, you know, why should riders care about braking, right? Like, so most of the time when people think about braking, they're talking more about like the braking system, right? Like, you know, how much power does it have, the modulation? And so they figure like, okay, as long as I can stop, you know, what does it matter? Isn't braking what you do to go slower? Like, I'm not gonna, you know, I don't need to worry about going slower, bro. I don't need braking. I mean, I could just imagine the, uh, the, the questions, just kind of the, the uh, comments that you get from riders that shows just kind of a misunderstanding of how important braking and braking efficiency is. So I guess just in a, you know, what, why should riders care more about this subject? 
Okay. So this is, this is a really great question. So I love this question. And if you think about the very highest level and you look at guys like Aaron Gwynn, he won a World Cup with no chain, right? So he pedaled one time and that's out of the gate to break his chain and then get up to speed. And he won the race, a downhill World Cup. It was incredible. So he didn't win that by obviously sprinting and he didn't win that by taking the sketchiest lines. He took that by breaking most efficiently, more efficiently than anyone else. It was incredible. So that's at the highest level. And we did a study on this uh, as part of my research where we brought in a bunch of beginners and a bunch of experts and we had them coast down this hill into a turn and we just looked at their break. So since we knew how much they weighed and we knew what the hill was like, we knew how fast they should be going because you can calculate all that. And we did it and the experts spent, I can't remember how much less time breaking. It was like maybe 1.1 seconds less breaking, but they went one second faster in one turn, just in one turn. And the reason they were able to do that is because they change, they just break differently, right? So they waited longer to break. They were happier to go at a higher speed. They braked harder when they did break. And the result of those two things was that they carried more speed through the turn. So mountain bikers, we all want to go fast, right? That's, I mean, I guess I speak for, for everyone, but you know, <laughs> I want to go out there and I want to go fast and breaking better is the easiest way for me to go faster. Pedaling harder sucks sometimes, right? But breaking more efficiently, we can make a change in one day and we can already be faster. Yeah, man, that, that's, that's really good insights. Uh, I, I explain to people sometimes because a lot of it comes down to efficiency, right? Like you're, it, it's, it's not who can do the most, it's who can do it most efficiently. And, and so the, um, you know, that, that idea of efficiency, you're, it's, uh, crap, man, I lost my train of thought on what my, uh, my analogy was there. So, um, no, I apologize, man. I was, but yeah. So, well, you know, I think what you're, you're, you can envision like along those lines is you envision that rider, you know, and let's just use me as an example. I go out there and I sprint and then I jam on the brakes in every turn. I sprint, I jam on the brakes in every turn. And like, yeah, maybe I can go like pretty fast, but I'm going to get bloody tired super quick. So, yeah. You know, we get a guy like you who rides smooth. You don't have to pedal as hard and you don't have to brake as much and you can go the same speed. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's like, that's how you want to get through a whole trail, right? Like keep your wits about you without digging deep and going cross-eyed and then break smooth and you're just going to have more fun. Yeah, no, that's totally it. Yeah. I, I as you're saying, I remember what I was uh, going to point out, like people get confused because what we want is momentum. I think you'd agree with that, right? Like momentum is what we're after. Momentum is, you know, basically more momentum you have, the faster you're going. And so pedaling is the most obvious form of gaining momentum, but it's not the only form of gaining and maintaining momentum. And so what you're talking about is like by breaking more efficiently, you're maintaining more momentum out of a corner than by breaking inefficiently. And you can make up for that inefficiency by pedaling. Right. And so yeah. you can you, you can pedal some and get back up to, to speed. And so but that's not the same thing. Like the process that you went through to get that momentum is not the same. And over the over the course of a, a long ride or a race, that's going to start to add up because you're going to have less energy at the end of the ride because you're you're putting in this making up for pat, you know, bad efficiency and with your braking technique and stuff. And so that's that's something that I think that. Um, if more riders really understood, it's like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm looking for momentum, right? That, and that's where like your, your technical skills come in because there's uh, at a, at a buddy in Hawaii who always called it free speed. He's like, man, there's so much free speed on the trail. You just got to know where to look. And, uh, totally. it's so true. Like if you know how to pump and, you know, hit corners properly, like you're getting free speed, like the trail is giving it to you. You're not having to expend a whole lot of energy to get it and understanding like, oh, okay, that's, that's one that part that's part of how you get momentum so yeah i mean i think that the the breaking thing and again like you can correct me if i'm wrong but i have uh um heard oftentimes that the fastest riders are usually the ones that break the least i mean is that uh yeah so like there's a lot of ways you could probably define it and um one of the things that we've 
uh, done with break is make it like easier to describe some of the terminology. So everyone's on the same yeah. page. Like you can look at the, the time that you break and yeah, definitely like the fastest riders are breaking for the least time. Yep. Yeah. And so again, it's one of those things, if you want to be faster and you can definitively point to like one of the factors that makes a rider faster, it's like, you know, you know the, then you would want to focus on that. And so if breaking less is one of these factors, then, then from a scientific approach standpoint, then that would be something you would focus on and, and using a tool like, uh, you know, I mean, really not like break ace, but, you know, pretty much break ace. Cause as far as I know, there's nothing else like it out there, um, helps people with that. So I guess at, at this point, like you've used the, the, the break ace for your studies. Um, I'm assuming you've also used it in coaching people. Is that, uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely. So yeah. So tell me a little bit more about that. Like kind of what, how, how does, what, what kind of data do you get? What kind of feedback are you able to give the riders? What kind of results have they seen from this process? Just, yeah, give us a, a little bit more about like how you're, you're using that with riders. Yeah. Okay. So I think I need to kind of preface this with, I am not a skills coach, right? So yeah. I'm a fitness coach and I've worked with riders at all levels to get fitter. And now we have break ace, which is probably more skills based. And I spent a lot of time with riders using break ace, not as a skills coach, right? Um, so, but they've been able to gain heaps of time using break ace just by taking new approaches based on the data. So one of the things that break ace does, and this is probably the best thing that it does, is it looks at all the breaking you've done across the trail and you might break like 98 times or something down a two minute trail a lot right and not everyone's bad and not everyone can be fixed so break ace filters through all that data and says here are three three places on the trail that you can improve the most okay so that's called the key opportunities and what we do with riders is we go down we do a run on a trail one minute to three minute downhill that they know they do a run and we find their key opportunities these places they can improve okay so then we look at the app that shows us where they are and we go there and we can see now what their breaking was. And then we can now look at the trail and we can find new approaches. So it didn't take uh, any proficiency on my end as a skills coach, because I am not proficient in it, but just like looking at what they did and then having the rider there at the trail and looking for a new approach to get through that faster has gained them on average five seconds on a two minute trail. So some have gained more, some of the pros have gained a little less, but everyone's gotten faster, which has been just, honestly, it's been amazing. Yeah, man, I, that's, uh, you know, you're the weak link, you know, that, that makes so much sense, right? Like it, it, it's one of those things that when you hear it, you're like, well, duh, but until someone points it out, like, oh yeah, that, I'd never really thought about that approach as far as like, you know, you got the whole trail and people want to improve over the whole trail as opposed to, okay, where's the weak link? within the trail, like where's this key opportunity is, is you uh, put it for me to get better. And so instead of trying to focus on this giant thing, well, let's focus on the smaller task. And, and then because it is that key opportunity, you're able to leverage that to gain an inordinate amount of time compared to how much time and effort you would put into other areas on the trail. Is that yeah, pretty much totally. Totally. And this like, um, so I don't consider myself a skills coach. I've done some skills coaching. So I really wanted to test this with a skills coach. So my good friend who I grew up racing with Harlan Price, who you may know, he's based in Virginia now, but he's an amazing racer. Now he's, uh, he's focused on skills coach coaching with uh, Pimbia. And he came all the way to New Zealand to try. Uh, he was doing some coaching in Australia, he came to New Zealand, we hung out and did some testing with Greg Ace as a skills coach. So we took him down a trail and he was even able to go faster just by finding where he could gain the most time. Because one of the things that I see, uh, like I see kind of seems like a, uh, maybe the wrong approach is that you see racers, especially racers or, you know, are just the rest of us. And we'll be out there on a trail looking at the sniper line, right? I don't know if you guys call it something else, like just like a real tricky line. Uh, you know, maybe cutting corner Strava line or something like that, mm -hmm. looking for these like medial ways to save time. 
So we might do something like super risky, like jump over 17 rocks, like into like a turn. Crash or not. And it might not really save that much time. So racers will always be doing this looking for like, oh, what's the fastest uh, straight line through here? And maybe you can gain like 0.2 of a second. So what we uh, want to do with break is, is we want to show you like, this is where you can gain the biggest amount of time. So let's go there and focus on that instead of focusing on things that are crazy or risky. Let's make it easy yeah. on ourselves. Yeah, no, that's uh, like I said, man, that's a, a really smart approach because it's, it's the risk to benefit ratio. And so if you don't have any objective way to tell what the benefit is, then it's really tough for you to understand what that risk to benefit ratio is. And so, yeah, like you said, like trying to freaking jump some crazy sketchy line into the turn to save like, yeah, 0.1, 0.2 seconds. And it's, you know, versus like focusing more of your time on this one section, like, hey, if you really focus more time here, like you can actually gain a full second, uh, you know, so that, that that's, that's really um, smart. I mean, like I said, because it's tough to have objective an objective way to tell where you can improve the most. And, and like you said, like braking and your braking efficiency is one of these really, you know, direct correlative correlative factors, you know, towards that, um, towards that. So yeah, man, that sounds like a really, uh, a really interesting tool. Um, so I guess in, in your studies, have you found that there's a, a common area Right. Is there a common theme that, that most riders tend to struggle with? I know people kind of have individual things, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure you probably noticed some trends like, you know, most riders tend to, you know, if, if we were if you were to, to categorize like where, you know, most people's key opportunities tend to be. Is it in, you know, uh, a certain type of corner or a certain uh, type of I, I don't know, like I said, it may, it may be not. I, I was just kind of curious what you what you've maybe noticed trend wise um, from, from all the studies, cause you actually have had a really unique viewpoint on our sport that not a lot of people can, can say objectively that they've had. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, um, every trail is different, mm -hmm. right. And we've tested, you know, we did testing at Lehigh with Jeff Lenoski, um, and we did testing in Rotorua and, you know, and every Lehigh is super rocky, Rotorua is super fast, but this, the trends are pretty similar. And one of the biggest uh, mistakes that I see is riders try to go into a tricky section too fast, right? So, okay, we're talking about going faster. So why would I not want to go into a tricky section really fast? Well, the problem, if you go into a tricky section too fast is you're losing, like you're out of control, right? And the only way to start to gain control on your mountain bike is to try and slow yourself down. So when these riders are going into these tricky sections without slowing down enough into them, they're just braking really hard the whole way down. And they're really risking, they're riding on the edge when they're doing that. And it's not a good idea to ride without control, right? We really want riders to be 100% in control when they're riding, especially at those most tricky sections. So one, that's one of the, the main themes that we've seen with these key opportunities is, okay, this is the trickiest section on the track. Let's actually try and slow down a little bit more into it so you can ride in complete control through it. And then, you know, they do the run the next time and obviously new key opportunities, that one disappears and they have an, another new place that they can focus on to get faster. Nice. Yeah, that's good. Uh, good advice. I think, um, too many people rely on momentum to get them through sections. I mean, you see it time and again where, you know, yeah, they're carrying way too much speed into, into sections. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed myself is, uh, you know, one of the reasons people do that is because they tend to not have very good slow speed balance. And this is one of those things that like, I, you know, I recommend people be able to do track stands. And I've, I've had some debates on this and seen people, uh, have different opinions on this but to me it always was like but you know momentum helps you balance right like it's why you can ghost ride a bike you know the momentum's holding the bike up but as soon as it starts to lose momentum it falls over 
And so track stands are just your, your no speed balance. Like that's your slow speed balance. And so I think that a lot of riders tend to try to ride too fast through sections because they're not comfortable with their slow speed balance. And then that puts them in these, these situations and uh, whereas if they were, you know, were able to, to be a little bit more confident, then they could slow down a little bit. And, you know, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, you probably agree with is like exit velo- or exit. Eh, it's not entry momentum or velocity. It's exit velocity. It's really the most important factor to that. So, I mean, is that, you know, pretty much what you're saying? Yeah, 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 totally. You know, exit speed in turns is, uh, is it's an amazing thing that we've really started to look at uh, a lot more. So like one of the things we do with break us is identify the apex. And uh, then we can also overlay the data on uh, the GoPro and things like that. And I've had some world cup riders and just looking at how they come into a turn and then how they exit it is totally different from me. And that's why that, you know, Mm -hmm. just light years ahead. Um, But they'll, they'll wait a really long time to break and they'll break incredibly hard at the apex of the turn. And then they're totally off the brakes. Um, and you know, they're also doing some tricky things with like front brake balance and things like that into the turns, but you know, they come out with so much speed and that's really what you want, right. Is to come out with speed because then they don't have to pedal me. You know, I might be on the gas or something like that. And I'm getting more tired as I go down. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, uh, um, again, that, that ability to carry momentum through corners. And cause I think that, uh, again, something a lot of people don't really appreciate because in the fitness world and, you know, the cycling fitness world, there's such a, a focus on the physiological side, which is important, but the reality is, is like, you know, your VO two max, like after a year or two of training, like you're not really going to see that thing improve a whole lot. And in fact, as you age, it's probably going to decline, but you find aging athletes in their, uh, their performance continues to improve as some of these physiological markers of, of, you know, predicting performance decline. So what's going on there. Right. And, and well, it's, it's the efficiency. Like as you become an older athlete, you've done this for so long that you're so efficient. You're like Steve Pete, right? Like that guy was, you know, Greg Menar, right? Like they're, they're so efficient efficient that they can make up for the fact that they they have declining physical uh attributes in these areas and so when you realize that efficiency is really that key to your long-term improvement that yeah vo2 max and these hard intervals and all this other you know stuff is 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 good but that real foundational element is going to be how efficient you are and and that's going to be the key and if more riders realize that I think more riders would, you know, appreciate the approach that you're taking. And I think the break ace is going to be one of these tools because it's hard to argue with data, right? Like people probably are, are going to not like it because it's telling them things that they don't like about themselves, but that's how you get better with stuff. And so I feel like, you know, the break ace is one of these tools that's really going to help riders eventually appreciate how efficiency matters more because you have an objective way to measure it. It's not just power meter and and heart rate and these physiological outputs it's like okay how is the efficiency affecting this and you can see that like man out of these you know three things heart rate power meter or brake ace like i would argue without having experienced brake ace for myself just knowing what i know about riding and hearing how it works that you would probably make better gains you know not that you're neglecting these other areas but if you're going to pick one data thing that you were going to use and focus on that that is probably going to help you improve as a rider more than these other things and so um so cool man i'm yeah i'm the more i talk to you about it the more excited i get about this uh <laughs> thing like i told you i've been watching yeah. it from the periphery you know for a few years so i'm uh but yeah, yeah. hear more about it from you is cool man so um yeah hey one of the things around that um that that measuring part is you know i coached um the u.s enduro champ seamus powell we were teammates uh, and then he made the jump to giant factory team and he ended up winning five national titles, um, which was amazing. He was, he's an incredible rider and incredibly fit because he came from XC transitioned to Enduro and he's winning all these races. And I'm looking at his data, like how the heck can I help this guy? You know, like I can help him be ready 
for the next enduro in like i don't know europe or wherever uh colorado you know he's a new york boy and um i'm looking at how hard he's pedaling i'm like well actually you won national champs and you pedaled like three times how can i as a like help you win more races right i i have no idea um you know so i could focus on all these fitness things for him and for a guy like him he doesn't have much gains that he can make in his fitness the rest of us really do and we can definitely benefit from that fitness but for him yeah i mean what are we going to do make his vo2 max like 0.01 higher or his threshold power you know higher um you know so that was really i'm just looking at it i was looking at it from the outside he's retired now but it's like this would have really helped Seamus win more races um, because of that efficiency thing like you say like and the data that we were looking at. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it, it makes it more specific to the trail. Like that's the, the specific problem that you're trying to solve as a mountain bike athlete is riding that trail presented to you. And I think that's one of the things like you, you said a couple of times, like you don't consider yourself a skills coach. And I know why you say that, but on some level, like, and, and I think you've, you know, kind of realized this, that like what you're doing is kind of like skills coaching because you're giving people the problem like what's the most important problem you need to solve and and i'm a strong believer that the human brain is the most you know fascinating uh problem solving machine ever created right we've sent a man to the moon and we can do with mother-in-laws it's you know so the <laughs> you know it's uh um god dang it dude i fucking forgot my train of thought again I don't know why I keep forgetting my train of thought. I'm going to have to do some editing on this one when we, uh, when we post it. So I apologize for that, no, but, uh, but yeah, man. So, uh, so I guess kind of, um, yeah, sorry. I, you're, 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 you're the problem is you've got me thinking about all these different uh, <laughs> aspects of writing, you know, and I've got like freaking 15 different things juggling around in my head. Like, dude, this point was awesome. And then you keep going. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, I got to remember to, you know, reiterate this point. Cause you know, this is, like I said, man, this is kind of like groundbreaking stuff on some level. Cause like you said, like, you know, what do you do with a high level athlete that there's not a whole lot you can do with them from a fitness side. And that's where the efficiency side, um, comes in. And, and that, that's, yeah, that's why I was saying like, you know, with the skills coaching thing, like, you know, you are kind of helping people in that area by giving them the right problem to solve. And then, you know, they'll, their brain can figure out like, how do I solve this problem versus giving someone the 10 steps of cornering, which, you know, may not necessarily apply to that situation or whatever. So instead of trying to teach someone that you're saying, no, now we need to figure out how to get you through this corner on this trail faster. And that's really the problem yeah. is, is a mountain bike athlete you're trying to solve. I mean, I, I think that's, that's pretty cool. So, um, so what, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I guess in, in working with riders, what do you see? Like, I mean, you kind of mentioned it, I guess, like too much momentum. Would you say like that is is probably like one of the main habits, like, a, you know, that leads to, to poor braking habits and, and poor efficiency? Um, you know, I'm just trying to think like for riders, you know, listening to this and they're like, all right, you know, what can I, I take away from, you know, uh, from this? You know, what are some of these common mistakes? That, that riders have. And it, it sounds like that, that just carrying too much momentum, either into a corner, into a, you know, a, a technical section, and then having to over break uh, to make up for that is, is one of those, those key things. Is that, is that pretty much what you, what you found? Yeah, that's definitely one of the big ones, especially when someone's really pushing it and trying to go faster, which is usually what they do. Um, but, you know, another one of the things, and you, you said it just before, is like finding the right problem to solve. And if you think about a Grom, I guess we call them Groms here in New Zealand, just, you know, yeah, yeah. Like a young kid that absolutely shreds, right? And what do they do with their buddies? Like, they're not out there doing like full race runs trying to get the Strava time. Like, they're out there picking the gnarliest turn, like trying to lay the bike down and try and go through it faster. Right. And then they go to the next turn. They see who can crash the most or, you know, whatever. Um, but what they do is they have, you know, I, I think of them as having unlimited time to just kind of try things on trails. 
And, you know, you and I and everyone listening kind of doesn't have unlimited time to go and session different parts of the trail. So when we go out there, we basically do the same thing every time. We go fast. We try and beat our friends, try and get the Strava time. We get to the end, get some beers, whatever. Um, and then what we miss along the way there is we miss like, okay, what, what is the problem and how do I solve it? So by showing um, everyone, okay, here is your key opportunity, your biggest problem that you can solve. Here's the right problem to solve. Now let's solve this just like a Grom would do. Let's try new approaches. You know, so me taking the non-skills coach, skills coach approach, it's like, let's try it. Okay, let's try this section. Try and slow down here. Like, here's the right problem. Here is the problem. Here's what you're doing. And we measured it. Let's solve it. Measure it again and see if you actually improved. Um, so I think, you know, when we look at the rest of those sections, you know, for someone, it might be they're overbreaking a lot in the rear. And, you know, they're kind of sliding through the turn or they're um, not breaking enough to get over a tricky section and they're coming through slow. So at that point, when you're looking at this other specific section, there's uh, the trends are super varied, as varied as the trails. Yeah, no, that's uh, um, yeah, good, uh, good insights. And again, just being able to to objectively measure that is uh, is, is such an important thing because, yeah, as you know, you're your time, like Strava times are so misleading. They're not all the same, right? Like you, you, you I've, I've always, you know, told people like, I'd rather you see two people and they're riding the same speed, but one guy is like flowing and, and looking smooth and the other guy is pedaling like his hair's on fire. And you just, me personally, I'd rather look like the first guy, you know, some people don't care, you know what I mean? They're like, I don't, I don't care. It's just, you know, for myself, like I, I believe in that, uh, you know, having some, some grace and some skill in how you're, you're doing your thing. And that's what, uh, I think that's worth the, uh, the break ace can, can help people do. And, and so, yeah, just even thinking from, um, you know, from a skills perspective, if you even want to call it that, like, you know, having, being able to, to check and see how different, uh, um, you know, like riding setups, like, I guess, I guess that actually is my next question. Like, have you found some different stuff from like different riding setups from, you know, like flats versus clipless or handlebar width or a uh, suspension setup, or, you know, what are, I guess, how, did, how have you found like equipment affect some of these, uh, these trends that you've seen? Yeah. Yeah. Like we've done some really like small setup changes and measured it with some of the world cup guys. And that's been like pretty interesting, but I know you're a big fan of flat pedals. And um, I spent, because you have your own pedal system, right? Yeah, the Catalyst pedal is, uh, yeah, yeah. Flat, flat pedal that I had uh, I had, uh, had brainstormed one day um, based on some a hypoxic insight on the trail. But uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Cool. Like, I don't really ride flats. Like, I grew up in XC, and they you know, stuck with clips ever since. But I was, we have, like, in New Zealand, like, half the riders use flats. I was like, I got to see what these flats are all about. So I spent a good week like measuring this stuff. And it was, um, the trails were slippery. And I was like, okay, let me get used to riding flats. And I feel great, by the way. I feel amazing climbing. And um, I should probably ride them more, especially based on what I found. Um, so I was like, okay, let's see how I go down this descent with my flats versus my clips. So I did um, run after run after run. And I analyzed my braking with the flats after I was used to them. And then with my clips that I'd been riding for years. And it was crazy because I braked less, you know, based on my flow score, which is this uh, major score that uh, we used to analyze your braking overall based on duration, intensity, and modulation. And so I braked less and went faster with flats. I could not <laughs> believe it, honestly. Like, so... Like I went through this data for, for ages trying to figure out like, okay, how is this possible for me to be able to go faster on flats when I don't even ride flats? And, you know, I looked at every turn. So there's like details on every turn. Um, I looked at all, all the different scores and what I was able to identify was that my cornering in flats was way better. Mm -hmm. Like, so I don't really, as like a non-flats rider, 
I don't know why it was better. I thought maybe like, cause I was able to lean my foot a bit on the pedal, like in some of these turns, like it was super greasy out. Uh, the trails were super slick. Um, I thought maybe that was it, but the, the funny, the like extra weird thing is like when I ride in flats, I feel so slow, right? <laughs> Especially when you get to like a flat section where you like kind of got to like lighten your bike over roots and your, mm-hmm. your pump. I just felt like an idiot. I was glad no one was around watching me. So I felt super slow in that section. And, you know, in the end, I wasn't actually slower there either, you know? So it's just like, this feeling, this mental thing that I had, like, I feel slow here. I'm going slow overall. But then you look at the data, went faster, went faster in this turn. This is where I gained time. Flats for me are quicker. Huh. That's very, uh, that's very interesting data. Um, I definitely have some, some hypotheses, hypotheses. Yeah. Tell um, me. What do you far? think? Yeah. Well, so, it, so if you uh, like surfed or skateboarded or anything like that, even like skiing or, or anything like that, like, cause like turning is about producing rotational energy. Right. And so I'm, I'm producing this rotational energy. And part of that is using my feet to transfer that rotational energy into whatever it is that I'm on and float on clipless pedals. You can't transfer that that rotational energy into clipless pedals because one you've got float. And if you rotated your feet too much, you don't clip. And so you learn how to ride your bike and, and corner in what is really kind of an unnatural way. Like we're made to, to transfer that energy through our feet into whatever it is that we're, we're on and we're trying to turn. And so with flat pedals, you can get that full rotation. Your, your body's doing all this rotating, creating that rotational force. And then it gets down to the pedals and you're able to, with flats, you're able to do that. Cause when you r- rotate your feet, you know, they're staying planted and rotating into the pedals versus like on clipless where they would unclip. And so your feet instinctively learn how to like not rotate as much. And so, you know, just from a natural movement standpoint, the uh, float is a really interesting um, thing because you're even when you're pedaling your bike, you're like, and again, as you know, like we don't produce energy in linear lines, right? Like it's, it's a rotational kind of a screwing motion that the foot goes into, goes through in and out of the ground. And so that, that, that screwing motion is rotational energy. And so with float, you're, you're losing that, that rotational energy that your body is actually producing and able to, um, you know, should be helping going into whatever it is that you're doing. And so, uh, you know, I have a whole, whole, you know, thing like, you know, the, the, your, your goal with the, with the pedal is to try and stabilize the energy that's being, that goes, that's going into that platform. And so what I think what the problem that we've been looking at the way that we should look at it is it's not like ball the foot or mid foot position. It's how many pressure points do you have? through your foot that in contact with the platform, is it a single pressure point system or is it a double pressure point system? And so a double pressure point system, and that's what the catalyst pedal is designed to do is to make use of that double pressure point system. It's long enough to where when you stand on it, you can get pressure underneath the front and back of the arch. And so it, that, that it, you know, people say like, Oh, mid foot, but like I said, it's not really mid foot because you can go mid foot on a regular flat pedal. You can go mid foot on clipless pedals, but you're still dealing with a single pressure point system. And so with a single pressure point system, any, uh, if, if you're not applying that energy directly into the, the platform, it's a rotating platform centered on a, or platform centered on a rotating axis. If you're not transferring that energy directly into the axle, like right above in the middle, any thing is going to start creating, uh, you know, um, the, the, the force going into the pedal is going to cause that platform to tip. Right. And so that tipping, that's why people's toes tip down, point down when they're pedaling is because it's that you're and so that energy instead of going down is actually rotating the, the platform forward. Well, how do you fix this problem? Well, one of the ways you can fix this problem is to attach your foot to the pedal. Right. Because that'll keep your foot from like coming off as you're doing this. And but then we got to add float because if you attach your foot to the pedal and you don't have some way for your foot to rotate a little bit, you're going to blow up your knee. 
Well, the other answer in, in that, you know, in my mind would be to we'll stabilize the energy going into the platform. And so, but you do that by adding a second pressure point. Now you're adding pressure on both ends of the platform. And so this gives you a wider margin of error and it stabilizes the energy. So now you don't have the, the platform tipping and you're able to make use of that rotational energy, right? Because now, because you're on a flat pedal, your, your, your foot can go through that natural rotation and it's actually adding to the pedal stroke. It's actually adding to cornering and movement and stuff like that. So, you know, my, my theory is that clipless pedals weren't ever really better. It's just that we had bad flat pedal design, right. That was designed based on the idea that since it looks like running or walking, that we should push through the ball of the foot, but because your foot isn't coming off the pedal, then it's more like doing step ups in the gym or, or something like that. So if your foot doesn't break contact with what it's on, well, that's when you want to have that double pressure point system. If it's coming off, like running, walking, things like that, well, that's when we transfer to the single pressure point system to actually like break contact with the ground. And so that's that theory is why most pretty much all the pedals have been designed based on a single pressure point system. And so um, so, yeah, I, I, I find that's one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we get from people like I've had you know, some pro riders that are sponsored by other pedals that I can't mention who've tried my pedals. And that, like I said, it's one of the biggest pieces of feedback we get is that when they're cornering, they feel like they're more efficient, that they feel more connected to the bike when they're cornering, because they're able to really like, you know, now with the double pressure point of the catalyst, you're able to really get that dig in and rotate and, and get that full, uh, um, momentum. So it's, uh, it, it's interesting that your uh, your dad showed because I know you I knew you did a study or a little something I, I didn't get a chance to actually get in on when you did the presentation so I didn't know what the the just you know for people listening like you know I I asked about that not knowing what the answer was going to be <laughs> and fully expecting for there to be like you know I you know, I didn't know what it was going to be but in hearing that I'm not surprised at all uh, to hear that because it, uh, it makes sense. It just allows your body to move better. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting that you, that you found that and that it only really took you a week or so of riding flats to kind of make that, uh, make that transfer. But, um, so I think what I really like to do is get you a pair of catalyst pedals so you can test, uh, catalyst pedals versus regular flat pedals versus clipless pedals and see what, uh, the break ace tells us uh, about, uh, about my theory with the, the, the pressure point system. But, um, so yeah, man, no, that, that's my, no, that's kind of a long winded, um, no, export. that's cool. That that's really cool. I, cause I, you know, as a non flats guy and yeah, yeah, I just never thought of it. So it, yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. The, the rumor on the internet is that bike James fell over on a stop, fell over to stop sign and rode off all pissed off. Uh, cause I tried clipless puddles. Right. And so, you know, and I did, I fell over to stop sign. I was with my then girlfriend, now wife, and literally some dudes drove by in a car and laughed at me. And <laughs> my thought was that literally like I, I I'm having way more fun on the trails. Like I was on my flats. And so I'll just, you know, use them until I feel like I need the, the clipless to, to be better. And, uh, um, so yeah, like, like I said, people think I rode off, like wanting to prove, flats were better. So I never had to switch to clipless, but it, it really has just been a lot of, uh, interesting study and, and, you know, thought on the subject and, um, thinking like, Hey, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to argue that at the top 1%, right? Like the, that maybe there's, there, that there's never, you know, that clipless puddles are worthless and they're, they should just go away. Right. Like, I, I don't know that I, but I do strongly believe that for the vast majority of riders out there, like 90, 95 plus percent of riders out there, um, that you can be just as good. And I think your data backs that up and just as fast on flats. Um, and you can make the argument. In fact, there was once that I came across that showed like clipless pedals, increase your chance of getting a hip injury if you're in a wreck. Right. So like there is data that supports, like, it's not just, uh, it, it, you know, opinion, like clipless pedals do increase your risk of injury, uh, if you're in a wreck. And so if you're able to ride just as fast, but without that risk, you know, and again, this is why I think like the, the big conspiracy theory in the cycling industry, because, you know, who, who would people wouldn't want to make that choice, you know, right? who would ride clipless pedals if they knew that they could be just as good on flats without all the mental stress and the, you know, the potential pain. And, 
like you said, for racers, it's a different thing, right? But uh, um, yeah. So, anyways, that's kind of been my 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 thoughts on it, kind of some of my uh, findings with it. But it's interesting that you kind of found that through through your own experimentation. So um, yeah, so that's cool. yeah, man. In New Zealand, like way more people ride flats. I like in Rotorua, where I'm on my way to now. I brought my flats with me, but uh, you know, at least half the people are riding flats. Yeah, yeah, you know, like I was a lot of sport for them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's becoming more common. I mean, I live in Fruta, um, you know, super common, you know, uh, bike area or, you know, big biking area and same thing. I, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, even on like pink bike, they'll have poles and, you know, over half the respondents will be like, I ride flats. And yet every year, you know, you've got this endless list of like awesome looking clipless pedal shoes and, and things like that. And it's like, here's your, you know, yearly brick of a skate shoe with sticky rubber on the bottom from 510 you know what i mean and it's like why can we not get the 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 same um you know attention and and you know thought as far as like you know shoes and some of the, the things like that go um but it is funny man yeah it is uh, more and more riders that are, are getting into it so um well cool man well i guess uh um i know we've i've had you for about an hour here so i, I don't want to take up too much of your time i guess uh uh, I guess, you know, wrapping up, I mean, any other kind of insights or words of wisdom or anything from, you know, the, the break a side or the, you know, physical training side or, or, or anything that, I don't know, any other things that you, uh, you feel, you know, be, be good to leave people with. Yeah. Oh, how would I, how would I sum it up? I'm not really sure. Um, I think one of the things that I would want people to remember is like information is all around us and information is helping us have more fun and ride faster. And, um, you know, mountain bikers have, uh, typically, you know, it was just, well, from the start, it was just a bunch of hippies in the woods, but now we have these incredible machines that are just so advanced and more people are riding. We're riding more, we're riding faster trails and, Technology and data is a huge part of why we can have more fun and ride faster and more people are riding and there's more trails. So yes, like it's about going out there and enjoying yourself out on the trails. But I do think like we're headed to a time and you know, we're we're already in that time and most everything else where you know our phones basically rule our lives and that's technology. It's like the the more information that we get. The, the better riders we're going to be. And that's definitely where the future is. And, you know, it's almost like e-bikes, people need to either embrace them or, <laughs> or they're going to be upset for a long time, you know? So technology is the same way. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, that's, that's a uh, good, good words to end with. I think, uh, but as well, I think you'd agree with all that information, there can be a lot of noise. And how do you cut through the noise yeah. and the things that are the most important? And that's why I like, I like, I keep going back. Like, you know, I think the data, what break ACE is providing is, is really an opportunity for people to cut through that noise and be able to get to like, okay, what really matters for me on this trail for this specific problem. So um, yeah, technology and data is great, but uh, we need more tools like break ACE to kind of help us cut through all that stuff and figure out where we can, make the most improvements, man. So, um, so cool. So where, you know, they got breakace.com. They can find out more about the, the, the breakace device. Um, they got mtbphd.com where they can go, they can sign up for your, uh, your email newsletter and, uh, you got a free, um, training program sample that they can, uh, download and, and check your stuff out. I know you've got the, the, the podcast at performanceadvantagepodcast.com. Um, anything else that you want to, you know, let people know about, um, how they can find out more about you or get in contact with you. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, I guess most mountain bikers are on Instagram these days. So you can check me out on Instagram at MTB underscore PhD or something like that. You know, obviously break ace is a huge part of what I do and helping mountain bikers get faster, just like yourself. And, you know, yeah, just, we like talking about mountain biking and doing mountain bike stuff, just like the rest of them. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the, 
that's the thing, man. You can tell when people are real riders doing it for uh, the love of helping other riders. Cause uh, dude, it's funny. People are like, man, why don't you like make programs for, you know, motocross? Like there's so much money in motocross. I'm like, man, I don't know why God sent me to save the mountain bikers. I got no idea, <laughs> but you know, he did. And I say that tongue in cheek, like joking, just more like, you know, that that's my people. Right. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, helping how you can tell when people are doing it because they want to help rather than just trying to make money or, Hey, there's an opportunity, uh, you know, a, from a marketing standpoint or something like that. So, um, so yeah, man, now I really appreciate what you're doing and, uh, encourage people to, to check you out and, um, yeah, learn more about break ace and, and how you can help them get faster. So appreciate your, uh, your time on the podcast today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, we're, uh, we're going to wrap up the podcast here. So, uh, yeah, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And you can check me out at bikejames.com, and I will talk to everybody next time.